Good evening and welcome. We are live tonight and uh, we're so excited as we're in the very first session of a brand new online Bible study as we go through the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts is one of my favorite books of the Bible and the book of Acts is sort of the sequel to the book of Luke. Luke would be part one and Acts would be part two. And since we recently completed a study on the life of the Apostle Paul, which we followed quite a ways through the book of Acts, I thought that it would be a good start to, uh, to, to just begin at the beginning of, of Luke's story. Tonight, in this very first session, we're going to simply do a quick survey of the entire Gospel of Luke and next week, we're going to jump in in an actual verse-by-verse -verse study of the entire Gospel of Luke. And if you're wondering exactly how long it's going to take us to go verse-by-verse -verse all the way through the Gospel of Luke, just let me say, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I kind of laid out a basic outline in my own notes for the first five chapters of the Gospel of Luke, and That'll probably take us through the last week of May. So three and a half months just to get through five chapters. So you do the math on how long it's going to take for us to get through the entire 24 chapters of Luke's gospel. So we better get started. Not long ago, I heard about a dear little lady who was officially pronounced dead which bothered her considerably because due to the fact that despite her periodic bout with rheumatism, she felt pretty good. Apparently, a computer operator in a social security office had mistakenly typed deceased on her account and with a perfunc uh, perfunctory uh, click, whir, and a blip, she was gone. Another casualty along the information superhighway. And eventually, she convinced the government that she was alive. Only after several frustrating phone calls to uh, workers who tended to take the word of a computer over her. How impersonal our world has become. Human life has been reduced to a number in a computer a consumer statistic in a pollster's file, a tiny cog in a giant machine. Missing that personal touch, that gentle look which knows our name and keeps us from getting lost in an anonymous crowd. What we need is a presence of compassion to restore our humanity. So, who we really need is Jesus Christ. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke especially, is shown as the compassionate Son of Man who comes to seek and to save those who are lost. And his story, as told by Luke's pen, has been aptly described as the Gospel of the Underdog. Dr. Luke reveals Jesus' sympathetic nature through such such signs which are unique to his gospel, such as these, raising to life the only son of a heartbroken widow, speaking tenderly to a nameless woman who anoints his feet with perfume, exalting a shunned ethnic group in his parable of the Good Samaritan, extending a friendly hand to a despised tax collector, See, Luke sees no limits to the love of God. Who was this gospel writer who presents Jesus in such human and personal terms? Certainly, he must have been a caring person himself. Commentator William Barclay writes, Somehow, of all the gospel writers, one would have liked to have met Luke best of all. For this gentle doctor with the tremendous vision of the infinite sweep of the love of God must have been a lovely soul. 
those who were with you during our Life of Paul online Bible study, you will remember that it was Dr. Luke who wrote the book of Acts. He was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. So let's get acquainted with this gentle man and the gospel that he wrote. We know that Luke was a doctor from Paul's passing comment in Colossians chapter 4 verse 14 with that revealed his profession as well as Paul's feelings towards him when he just simply refers to him as Luke, the beloved physician. Now the context of that verse shows that Paul grouped Luke with both Epaphras and Demas, distinguishing them from the previous list of Jews who are from the circumcision. Now that leads us to believe that Luke himself was actually a Gentile. If so, he is the only Gentile writer in the entire New Testament. In the Apostles' letter to Philemon, Paul mentioned Luke as one of his fellow workers in verse 24. And those two men, they worked together, and they traveled side by side, Paul with his lecture notes and scrolls, and Luke with his medical bag and his encouraging words. And from their first expedition together, in Paul's final hours in a Roman dungeon, Luke remained a true friend to him. Uh, in fact, at one point, Paul writes to young Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he says, Only Luke is with me. Who can measure the depth of Paul's gratitude towards Luke? He was more than just a physician. He was a lover of people. He was a healer of the soul. He was also humble. Having also authored the book of Acts, he penned 28% of the New Testament, more material than any other writer, and his Greek has been recognized as the finest in all of Scripture. Luke actually wrote more material than the Apostle Paul did, if we don't count Paul as the author of Hebrews. Yet, not once did Luke include his name in his own works. The closest he came was in the we sections in the book of Acts, where he referred to himself in a most understated manner, beginning in Acts chapter 16, verse 10. It says, And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now apparently, this is where Luke joined uh, Paul's team, here in Troas, as Paul was about to embark on his journey through Macedonia. We know little about his life prior to this time. Picking up a few clues from his writing, however, some scholars have pieced together theories about his place of birth, his education, and his Christian experience. The first clue comes from the name of the person to whom Paul addresses his gospel. In Luke chapter 1, verse 3, we read, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Now, Theophilus may have been a wealthy citizen of Antioch. And since physicians were often freed men, then it could be that Theophilus once actually owned Luke as a slave and had set him free after educating him as a physician. The title, Most Excellent, which Luke gives him, seems to bear out that contention. Interestingly, the very name Theophilus means friend of God. Now, Theophilus may have possibly been a believer, and Luke may have been one who actually led him to the Lord. Later, he decided to read, uh, write his gospel, and later on, the book of Acts, to help ground his generous benefactor in the Christian faith. So where did Luke acquire his excellent writing skills and his medical training? Bible scholar A.T. Robertson provides us with a possible answer. 
He says if a freedman of Theopolis at Antioch, he would receive a good education in the schools there. As a physician, he would be sent by Theopolis either to Alexandria, Athens, or Tarsus, the great universities of the time. Alexandria seems to be unlikely in the absence of any allusion to the city. We know that Luke seems familiar with Athens in Acts chapter 17, but Tarsus is much more likely. Now, if Luke did attend the university in Tarsus, it may have been there that he actually met Saul of Tarsus, the future Pharisee who grew up in that same city and possibly attended that same university. Another option has Paul already converted to Christianity before Luke started school in Tarsus. And possibly Paul led Luke to the, to the Lord after returning to Tarsus from Jerusalem. Or scenario number three, perhaps Luke became a Christian in Antioch after medical school. He tells us himself in Acts chapter 11 verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists or the Greeks preaching the Lord Jesus. And verse 24, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Luke may have been among those Greeks who were added to the Lord. Now, the exact details of his conversion remains a mystery, but we do know that Luke stuck by his commitment both to the Lord and to Paul. And it's entirely possible that Luke was with Paul even at his execution, and that Luke, doubtless, he saw to the burial of his great friend. With compassionate hands, he laid Paul to his final rest caring for him to the very end. Truly, he was a beloved physician. Now, every aspect of Luke's gospel displays his personal touch, from his literary composition to his portrayal of Christ. Four characteristics of his work stand out in particular. First of all, the gospel of Luke is a sizable work, written with extreme care. Luke wanted Theopolis and anyone else who might read his book to know the exact truth about Jesus. With the care of a physician examining a patient's charts, he not only studied the accounts of eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, but he also compiled reams of data and methodically recorded the events in an orderly account from the very first. And that's what he told Theopolis in the very opening verses of the gospel. Now the second thing that we see here is Luke is not the first gospel account. Um, we actually believe that Mark was the first gospel, casting Jesus in the role of a servant. And then he passed the gospel pen on to Luke, who wrote his book sometime during the decade of the A.D. 50s. As a doctor, Luke gave a second opinion, if you will, of Christ, seeing him through the eyes of the cultured Greek as the idea man. A third characteristic we discover is, is that Luke is a book for the detail-oriented person. If you like knowing all the facts, then the Gospel of Luke is your book. Compare, for instance, the different ways that Mark and Luke introduce John the Baptist. Mark simply writes in Mark chapter 1 verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But notice the precision with which Luke, the historian and the physician, writes. Luke chapter 3 verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Antonia, and the region of Traconius and of Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, 
while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Whew, that's a lot of information, isn't it? Another characteristic we find in Luke's writings is that Luke highlights the humanity of Jesus. Now, it makes sense that of all the gospel writers, the physician, the doctor, would be the most interested in the man, Jesus. Uh, now, if you read the Gospel of John, he tends to zero in on the divinity or the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God. But Luke focuses on the humanity of Jesus. And reading the Gospel of Luke, you get the feeling that you are listening through the doctor's stethoscope to the heartbeat of the Lord, feeling his empathy as he reaches out to those who cross his path. You know, many times throughout the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. This emphasis on Jesus as the Son of Man, it points to his humanity. We think of Luke as a Greek writing to a Greek. The Greeks were an idealistic-minded people. Their philosophers and their moralists had their theoretic idea of perfect manhood. And Luke sets forth Jesus in all the simple purity, lovely naturalness, profound beauty, and the moral sublimity of his sinless manhood. To Christian believers, however, Jesus means something nearer than that. He is our perfect example. His manhood is our pattern. We are called to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, that is our life's aim. And that's really the whole reason for this study. Our desire is not necessarily that you remember every date and outline, but that you take a good, long look at Jesus Christ. Listen to his heartbeat, as Luke did when he wrote his gospel. Feel the compassion of Jesus. Feel the passion of Jesus. And experience his joys and his sorrows. Let his attitudes be your attitude. Let his actions be our actions. You know, as we set out on this great adventure together of Christ-likeness, take these words as your guiding compass. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Let's just examine a few of the events in the life of Jesus that are unique, that are only written in the Gospel of Luke, that particularly draw out his humanity. Between chapters 9 and 19 alone, there are no less than 30 or more scenes that are uniquely reported by Luke in his Gospel. It's not only the intrinsic worth of these parables and miracles and incidents which make them mean so much to us, but it's the way that they reveal Jesus to you and I as we read through the Gospel of Luke. One after another they come, like so many successive floodlights of different color turned on an object of supreme attractiveness. All bear on the human nature of our Lord. These successive floodlights shine on every area of the life of Christ, from his birth to his death, resurrection, and ultimately his ascension into heaven. Luke describes the birth and the childhood of Jesus. Uh, Luke's account is the most intimate account of the birth of Jesus. Where Matthew takes a snapshot of the event, he just simply says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Luke films the drama in technicolor for us. Now, as we read his account, we get to walk beside the weary couple to Bethlehem while Mary is with child. We can feel the disappointment of the closed inn. 
and we can watch with wonder at the birth, and we can see the loving mother wrap the child in, in swaddling clothes and lay him there in that manger. We fall before the angels. We search with the shepherds. We join with adoration and gaze at young Mary as she caresses that baby, treasuring that eternal moment. Luke keeps the cameras rolling through the, the childhood of Jesus. We go with the family to Jesus' dedication in the temple. And we hear the blessings that are pronounced uh, uh, by those folks in, in the temple. And we return to his Nazareth home. Then we get a glimpse of the boy Jesus as a 12-year-old in the temple. He's amazing the elders and already is attending to his father's business. We also see that Luke traces Jesus' genealogy back to Adam. Matthew traces Jesus' lineage to Abraham because he wants to display Jesus to, be, to the Jews as the Hebrew Messiah. Mark considers a genealogy unnecessary for his purposes, and so he leaves it out altogether. John uses a prologue instead of a genealogy to establish his theme of the deity of Jesus. So Luke's approach is different from the other three. He focuses on the humanity of Jesus, and so he links Jesus all the way back to Adam, the first human. Luke also devotes much space and interest in people. You know, a child of Adam, like everybody else, Luke's Jesus is a savior for all people, regardless of race, sex, or creed, introspective of, of social status, physical health, or moral background. That's why Luke includes these unique stories that illustrate the compassion Jesus had for everyone. Uh, the hemorrhaging woman who could not be healed by anyone. The parable of the prodigal son or the ten lepers. Luke also describes the suffering and the death of Jesus in graphic detail. As vivid as Luke's account was of the birth of Jesus, it pales in light of his graphic portrayal of the death of Jesus. Using his palette of medical terms, he paints a striking picture of the suffering of Jesus as he was hung on the cross. Viewing Luke's passion account will truly make you feel that you were actually there as they crucified our Lord. We also see that Luke provides us with two hidden outlines of his book. Uh, Luke's theme verse also reveals a memorable outline for his gospel. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we read, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And from the nativity through the wilderness temptation of Jesus, the Son of Man comes. From Jesus' first public appearance to his ministry in Galilee and his final trip into Jerusalem, the Son of Man seeks. And from the Last Supper through his post-resurrection appearances, the Son of Man saves. So the Son of Man comes, the Son of Man seeks, and the Son of Man saves. Another outline emerges from the conversation Jesus had with the two men on the road to Emmaus. He asks them what they're talking about, and they respond back to him in Luke 24, verse 19. And they, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. 
When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now, their response to Jesus on that road hands us the book of Luke in a nutshell. Jesus appears as the promised prophet in Luke chapter 1 through chapter 4. And then we see that Jesus shows himself to be mighty indeed during his Galilee ministry from Luke chapter 4 through Luke chapter 9. And then journeying towards Jerusalem, Jesus becomes mighty in word from Luke chapter 9 through Luke chapter 21. And finally in Jerusalem, Jesus is crucified and resurrected. That's at the end of the, the gospel of Luke. Now, if you sometimes feel lost in a world that degrades and dehumanizes, allow this ancient physician to acquaint you with the Son of Man, the Divine One with the human touch. He identifies with the real world. See, Jesus knows where we live and where we work. He toiled under the harsh sun and under the hard earth under his feet. And he understands what real life is all about. Jesus is touched by real needs. We might see Jesus as deity standing in raiment of shining, shining white, but we also need to see Jesus as the son of man kneeling before a ragged leper. And as the Son of Man, he views our human suffering through the eyes of one who has suffered himself. As the Son of Man, he feels our own pain as if it were his own. We also see that Jesus brings real comfort. You know, just knowing that someone understands is reassuring. But Jesus even takes it a step further. He offers us real comfort as the great physician who not only sympathizes with souls who are lost in sin, but he saves them through the power of the cross. As you prepare to meet this Jesus who came for all people, ask yourself, what is my attitude towards outsiders? Are there certain groups are types of people that you find difficult to love? Commit yourself right now to let the compassion of Christ for the lost of this world fill your heart. May the wellspring of your love for others grow deeper with each page of his life that you read as we go through this study over the next few months. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to come to you and thank you. We thank you for your word that feeds us. Father, I thank you for those that have tuned in to view this video this evening. Father, I pray that as we embark on this Bible study together, Lord, that you would bless our hearts, that you would help us to learn about your son, Jesus, but most of all, Lord, that we would become more like him. Father, help us tonight. We thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. A few weeks ago, we began a Sunday morning sermon series from the book of Galatians, and we're calling that Galatians, the Gospel of Grace. And this Sunday is going to be week number seven of our sermon series out of the book of Galatians. We are looking at Galatians chapters 3 and 4, and we are looking at seven promises that you can count on. So I hope that you'll join us this weekend. If you're unable to be with us Sunday, be watching for a video of the message to be posted sometime Sunday around noon, both on Facebook and YouTube. And don't forget, Lord willing, we'll be back next Wednesday night at 6.30 for our live online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. Next week, we're going to be on session two of this study, and we're going to start at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, verse by verse, 
And so we hope that you can join us. This Bible study on the Gospel of Luke is only online. It's the only place you're able to view it, so I hope that you can join us. If you miss any of the lessons or sermons, you can check them out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using your Gmail account and you can subscribe to that channel. So I hope that you'll check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.